So let's review what we've covered in Unit 5. Unit 5 is about proper time. We started by thinking about paths in space. Not space-time, but just regular space, x and y. So let's say we're getting from point A to B along a curved path, not a straight path. And we want to know how long is this curved path? What would a, what would a car odometer read if it took this curved path? Um, and the challenge is, well, we don't know a formula for curved path length. All we know is how to calculate the um, length of a straight line, the hypotenuse of a triangle. So what we said was, all right, well, let's just view this curve as a whole bunch of tiny little straight lines, figure out the length of all those, and then the total path is just the sum of all the straight lines that make up this curve. And then this is all the fancy math for that. And in calculus, it looks like this. It's expressed as a definite integral from the starting y to the ending y. But in the special case where this is constant, the dy over dx, then this equation simplifies considerably. We don't need this fancy calculus, and we can just multiply directly. It's this length times that. So um, geometrically, dx dy being constant just means that this path is a straight line. So really, this is just a fancy uh, way of writing the Pythagorean um, formula for the length of the hypotenuse of a, of a triangle. So then we analyze a similar situation, but in space-time. So now he, it's time and position. And suppose in space-time, somebody follows a curved world line. So um, physically, they're at point, they're at the origin, they move away, and then they come back. So a clock that's moving along this world line would calculate a proper time. Um, it's a clock that's present at both events, so that's a proper time. So we'd want to know, okay, well, what proper time interval would be uh, experienced or read by this clock? And we said, all right, well, we don't have a formula for proper time, but we do have a formula for the space-time interval. And that's the time interval um, along a straight line path in space-time, a straight line world line. So what we did is, just like for space, but now it's space time, we divide this curved world line into a bunch of straight world lines, and we apply the metric equation, and we do a little bit of math and a little bit of algebra, and we re-express dx dt as velocity, and we get this, so that the proper time is um, this definite integral. That's the calculus version of that. So again, here's the calculus version. But in the special case in which v, which is speed, not necessarily velocity, but if you're moving at constant speed, then proper time, delta tau, takes this pretty simple form. 1 minus v squared square root times delta t, where delta t must be a coordinate time. We spent the rest of the unit um, exploring um, implications of this equation. And the first thing we did was say, you know, um, often we're going to have really small v's, because um, remember, v equals 1 is the speed of light. And in that case, there's a mathematical approximation that's super, super useful. And that's the binomial approximation. That says if we have an expression like this, 1 plus x to the a, that's approximately equal to 1 plus ax, as long as x is much less than 1. So again, this is super useful, very commonly used in physics um, and elsewhere. So the way we used this was we had this expression, 1 minus v squared, um, to square root, and square root is the same as a half power. So then for a, I have half, so, and for x I have v squared, so we have this. That this square root is roughly 1 minus half v squared, as long as v is much less than 1, as long as the object in question is moving um, at a, a very small fraction of the speed of light. So then going back to the proper time formula, um, we can do a little bit of algebra and get a really useful expression. So here is um, that square root thing. Here I'm replacing it with its binomial approximation. And then to go from here to here, I distribute the delta t. Delta t times 1 is delta t. Delta t times minus blah is minus blah times delta t. And then the last thing I do is I subtract delta t from both sides. So just move this over here. And I get this, and I took absolute value just to make the difference positive. 
So what this says is the difference between a coordinate time and a proper time is, if v is um, small, roughly equal to half v squared delta t. And if you try to calculate delta tau and delta t separately on your calculator, those numbers will be so similar that, that you might not even be able to notice the difference. Um, but if you calculate the difference directly using this formula, you'll be able to get the answer um, without having to fight with your calculator. All right, so then we talked about relations among time intervals. And we went through this figure, and again, this figure is based on one from Tom Moore's book. So delta tau, that's the um, time interval uh, measured by, uh, between two events, measured by a single clock that's present at both events. And that will depend on the world line of the clock. Different world lines give different delta taus. But there's a special world line, the straight world line, constant velocity. And in that case, that proper time is also the space-time interval. Remember, the space-time interval is the time interval between two events as measured by an inertial clock that's present at both events. Coordinate time is time measured in an inertial reference frame. So some um, coordinate system we've set up with clocks. Um, and the particular coordinate system where, um, or the particular reference frame, where, the, uh, where there's a clock that happens to be present at both of the events, that would be a coordinate time that's also a space-time interval. But there are lots of other coordinate times that aren't space-time intervals where the two events in question occur at different locations. So then, um, by working with the equations for um, uh, world lines uh, and uh, paths in space, we came up with these relationships. Let me say this one first. Um, so the path length, that's this, now this is for space. For uh, a curved path is going to be longer than a straight line path which is going to be longer or equal to one of the coordinates. I wrote it in this case as y. The situation is reversed for time intervals and special relativity. The proper time interval is the shortest time interval, and then we have the space-time interval, and then we have the coordinate time. So why are these backwards? That all stems from um, the fact that they have different geometries. So that the distance equation or the metric equation for space is the Pythagorean distance formula. But for space-time intervals in space-time and relativity, it's not Pythagoras. So there's this minus here. And that imposes a different geometry on, um, on space-time than there is on space itself. So this brings us to the end of Unit 5. We've spent the last couple units thinking about time intervals, coordinate time, the space-time interval, and in this unit, proper time. In unit six, we'll start thinking about spatial differences again. Um, delta x will come back into the equation more. Our starting point for doing that will be to think about the geometry of space-time. And we'll start with the metric equation as we have before. Delta s squared is delta t squared minus delta x squared. And so um, we'll see not only how time intervals are different for different observers, but how space intervals are different for different observers and different reference frames, and how those differences are related. Where we're headed in Unit 6 is to derive the Lorentz equations. And those are equations that let one um, translate the space-time coordinates of an event as measured in one reference frame to the space-time coordinates as measured in another reference frame. They're the relativistic analog of the Galilean transformations that we started the course with. And we'll do so um, using both algebra and a nice geometric approach that will let you not only, I think, carry out calculations, but get a, if such a thing is possible, an intuitive feel for what's going on. So that's what's coming up in Unit 6. We'll see you then.